Uh, I am Michael Pritchard, and we are so excited to be hearing from San Francisco's District Attorney, Chesa Bodine. Chesa was elected in November 2019 on a forward-thinking platform with a focus on ending mass incarceration, protecting crime survivors, and addressing the root causes of crime. In addition to having attended Yale Law School and being a law clerk on the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Ninth Circuit, and the District Court of Northern District of California. Bowden previously worked as a deputy public defender in San Francisco. And as a public defender, he helped lead the office's bail reform unit. Since being elected district attorney in 2020, his forward thinking policies included eliminating cash bail, ending racist sentencing enhancements, discouraging the police from using racist and biased stops, allowing victims of police violence to access victims' compensation, providing diversion programs for parents in the justice system, and ensuring that cases relying solely on the word of officers with documented serious misconduct are not prosecuted. Please give a warm welcome to District Attorney Chesa Bodie. Thank you so much, Dr. Pritchard, for the kind introduction. And of course, thank you to the California Association of Youth Courts and Judicial Council of California for inviting me to speak to all of you today at the 17th Annual Youth Court Summit, along with Secretary of State Shirley Weber, uh, who I admire. And of course, we have the Honorable Judge Cousins with us here today as well, among many other distinguished leaders in the field. I am such a big supporter of the mission of the California Association of Youth Courts in disrupting the school to prison pipeline and working to put the justice in our juvenile justice system. I wanna thank everyone who's here today to support this mission and to think about how we can improve the criminal legal system. I hope that our conversation today helps to inspire ideas and action for change. I'd like to talk to you about my own experiences as a kid impacted by incarceration and how that has shaped my own life journey. I also want to discuss how it is that I came to be San Francisco's district attorney and some of the challenges and accomplishments that my office has faced in my first 15, uh, now 18 months. I also want to talk about areas that I know we can all agree we need to improve our system. And I particularly look forward to a vigorous and robust back and forth during a question and answer period at the end. When I was 14 months old, my parents left me at the babysitter and they never came back to get me. That day while I was playing, my parents drove the getaway car for an armed robbery that tragically left three men dead. Although neither of my parents was armed and they weren't even at the scene of the robbery, they were both convicted of New York State's felony murder law. My mother served 22 years in prison. My father is still incarcerated today and he may never get out. I don't remember their arrest or their sentencing. In fact, my earliest memories are waiting in line to go through metal detectors and steel gates just to give my parents a hug, just to see them, touch them. So I know personally, firsthand, the devastating impact that our approach to criminal justice can have on kids. And I know that the decision that my parents made to participate in that terrible crime had devastating consequences, not only for me as a child left behind, but also of course, for the three families who lost their father, their breadwinner, their husband. As a young child growing up visiting my parents behind bars, I often blamed myself, I often felt responsible as though uh, if only I could have talked, I might have been able to warn them or it, perhaps if I'd been more lovable, they wouldn't have risked losing me in uh, participating in that terrible crime. These sorts of uh, developmental challenges and, and emotional challenges are really common amongst children with incarcerated parents. And I, like many others, acted out as a kid. I struggled academically. I didn't fully learn to read until I was nine. Um, I didn't always um, manage to interact well uh, in the classroom or with, with uh, friends at social events. And these kinds of struggles that, that I experienced are so prevalent 
among the millions of American children who grow up with an incarcerated parent, ultimately in large part due to white privilege, due to growing up in an upper middle class stable family, due to the support I had from therapists and academic tutors and, and so many other privileges and second chances, I was able to overcome those early difficulties. And I was able to end up going on to become a lawyer and now San Francisco's district attorney. But I wanna talk about that process because it wasn't uh, it wasn't easy. It wasn't just uh, flipping a switch from one day to the next. It was, in fact, a process that required years of effort on my part, yes, but also in a context that was created for me by a loving family and community, by teachers and by uncles and aunts and adoptive older brothers who created the conditions that allowed me to make mistakes and recover, that allowed me to learn from my obstacles and challenges and to harness and change um, and to channel the energy, uh, the anger that I often felt as a kid into productive outlets. Um, school was transformative for me in that regard. It gave me the opportunity to participate in sports and model United Nations and chess club and so many other things that I'd savored. The ability to theorize and think and read and imagine the world as it should be, not simply as I knew it. I also got to know some children in the prison visiting rooms whose parents were incarcerated with my parents who did not have the kind of opportunities that I had even as they faced many of the same challenges. I saw the school to prison pipeline. I saw how it funneled and dehumanized children, how it fails to keep our communities safe or to recognize the full potential of every single young person in our community. One of those young kids who I got to know actually was a role model for me when I first met him. When I was uh, at my most aggrieved and, 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 and struggling the most in school, when I was eight or nine, he was a couple of years ahead of me and his mother was incarcerated with my mother. My mom was there, as I said, for felony murder. His mother was a casualty of the war on drugs. She was serving a decades long prison sentence related to drugs, not violence. Now, this young man's name is Lorenzo. He was black and I was white. We had a lot of other things that were different, but we visited our mothers in the same prison visiting room. We became friends. And my mother would often say to me, can't you be more like Lorenzo? He, he was a straight A student. He was the star of his basketball team. He was winning statewide writing competitions. And then at some point we stopped visiting on the same days. We fell out of touch. He lived in New York in a poor immigrant neighborhood in East uh, in East Brooklyn. I, at that point, had moved to Chicago and was being raised by an upper middle class white family. Lorenzo was an immigrant, having been born in South America. I was native born. Um, we had all these differences. And years later, after, thanks to those second chances I mentioned earlier, I had made it into Yale College. My freshman year, I picked up the mail, went back to my dorm, and I opened a letter from my incarcerated father the big stamp of a correctional facility on the top of the letter. I open the letter and I read it and it tells me that my dad has met someone on his cell block, someone who tells him he's a friend of mine and his name is Lorenzo. My friend Lorenzo, the straight A student, the role model, the person who would talk me down when I had an outburst in the prison visiting room, himself was now incarcerated in the same jail cell, same jail block as my father, even as I was starting my academic career at Yale. Now, it didn't have to be that way. It didn't have to be that way. If Lorenzo had had the same kinds of opportunities and second chances that I've had, I know, I know he would not have ended up incarcerated. I know he wouldn't have harmed the people who were victims in his crimes. And I know he wouldn't have gotten deported, which is exactly what happened to him after he served his five year prison sentence. Now, I tell this story in part, tell Lorenzo's story, I tell my story in part because I know that class and immigration status and race are such a critical determining factor in outcomes in our society. And I know that if I hadn't had some of the privileges that I've been so lucky to have, I wouldn't be standing before all of you today 
proudly representing the city and county of San Francisco. And I know that if Lorenzo had shared in the privilege, that he likely would still be in the United States and he'd be paying taxes and raising his family here instead of in a country that he had never known before being deported there. Being in a role where I can impact and influence future generations and hopefully ensure that there isn't another Lorenzo, another person whose talent and potential is wasted because of something as silly as this country's approach to the failed war on drugs. Now these personal experiences with incarceration and the criminal justice system and the disparities that I observed and going back to visit Lorenzo in my father's prison and exploring the choices he's, he had made and the context in which he made those choices ended up pushing me towards law school and towards working to reform the same legal system that had so directly impacted my life since before I could remember. And I went to law school knowing that I wanted to fight to end mass incarceration, right? The United States leads the world in locking people up, about 4% of the world's prisoners and somewhere around 25%, excuse me, 4% of the of world's population and somewhere around 25% of the world's prisoners. We spend more on policing and incarceration than any other country in the history of the world. And yet our crime rates don't, we're not the safest country, but we spend the most on, on punishment and on incarceration. And, and I recognize and I had experienced firsthand the many ways in which our reliance on, our addiction to in, in caging human beings has actually undermined safety, right? I, I knew Lorenzo's story. I saw what happened to him in ways that could have been avoided if his mother wasn't incarcerated. And at the time I went to law school, the obvious path to do that kind of work was to become a public defender. And that's what I did. After a couple of judicial clerkships, I became a deputy public defender in San Francisco. And in that role, I witnessed every day, time and time and time again, the devastation that incarceration causes for individuals, for their families, for entire communities. I saw systemic problems play out every day in court. Um, I saw the ways in which convictions and incarceration or, or punishment meted out through the court process failed to address the root causes of crime, set people up to reoffend, to lose housing or jobs rather than to obtain them. And as a public defender, I represented individual people, my clients, whose paths to incarceration stemmed very clearly and directly from some of the challenges they'd face, things like homelessness and addiction and poverty, parental incarceration as well. I saw the ways in which racism and white supremacy impacted the majority of people who I served at every stage of their life from, from education to housing, to healthcare, to employment, and how those disparities were often amplified and exacerbated by the criminal legal system. And I knew that in order to change our approach, in order to end mass incarceration, in order to reduce the racial disparities that I saw play out day in and day out, we had to take a different approach, a different approach to crime and punishment, a broader view of how we build safety, that it's not just something that is reactionary when crimes occur, but that instead we are proactive at preventing crime. We needed a new perspective, one grounded in data and compassion rather than fear and racism. We needed to think radically. And I wanna borrow a phrase from my friend, Angela Davis, who describes the word radical as meaning simply grasping things at the root. We needed to address the root causes of crime if we're serious about safety and justice. San Francisco, about 75% of the people booked into our county jail are drug addicted, mentally ill, or both. We need to look past fear mongering and finger pointing and viral tweets and actually do the work to solve the things that create crime and undermine safety in our communities. After years of defending cases, one at a time, after years of my own experience, decades of visiting my own parents in prison, I realized that the system itself needed change. I would never be able to effectively address all of the problems that I saw parading through the courthouse in a sea of orange jumpsuits if I did it one case at a time. And so I decided in a very different political context than when I went to law school 
to run for district attorney. The context was a national recognition of the failures of our approach to criminal justice, a national recognition that prosecutors had a role to play in fixing a system that for many decades they had been part of, of building uh, and, and perpetuating. And a recognition that uh, there was political space for movements like the Black Lives Matter movement, right? To come up and demand equal enforcement of the law, centering victims regardless of what they're asking for, not only when they want the death penalty, but also when they're asking for restorative justice. And I was very clear as I ran for district attorney about who I am and about what I intended to do when I won office. Consistent with my values and my life experience, I was not going to run to win. I was not a politician. I was going to run to make sure that the voice and the experience of my professional career as a public defender and my personal experience as a child of incarcerated parents was represented in the race, in the conversation that all of San Francisco was having in 2019 about criminal justice and public safety. So I ran on a bold platform, a platform promoting victims' rights, promoting equal enforcement of the law, and promoting a approach to public safety that recognizes that we cannot simply measure our safety by the number of people we send to prison or the number of years that we hold them in cages. Recognizing that we can fight racial inequity as we end the criminalization of poverty. And if we do those things together, we will be safer as a result. We can do things like end money bail and replace a wealth-based system with a risk-based system. We can stop the use of racist sentencing enhancements, and we can promote restorative justice when victims ask for it. We can treat kids like kids, and we can hold police who commit crimes accountable the same way we hold anyone else who violates the law accountable. We can, in other words, enforce laws equally, and we can end mass incarceration while building safer communities. Well, it turned out that my message and my commitments resonated with the majority of voters in San Francisco. And I won my race and I was sworn in as San Francisco's district attorney in January of 2020. Now I never could have imagined, I don't think any of us could have imagined back then how much the world and San Francisco would change during just my first couple months in office. I certainly wouldn't have been able to tell you what Zoom was or imagine that I would be giving this speech via Zoom rather than in person. But as we all know, COVID-19 hit abruptly, suddenly, almost out of nowhere. And overnight, it seemed, everything about our society was different. We learned to telecommute via Zoom. Um, I spent most of the last year, my first year in office, working from a home office rather than being able to go in day to day and see my staff in action. And I know that the COVID-19 pandemic has also particularly hit those who were already most vulnerable. We know that there were uh, horrific racial disparities in who uh, contracted the disease, who died from it, who lost their jobs, who lost their housing, folks who didn't have health care. Those who were incarcerated were all particularly vulnerable. It also severely undermined our ability to move criminal cases forward. On day one, I inherited over 5,000 criminal cases. And since taking office 18 months ago, I've now filed over 6,500 new criminal cases. All the while, our courts have mostly been closed. We have not been allowed, except for here and there, occasionally during the false start reopenings, to call in juries, to conduct jury trials. And so it's been a tremendous limiting factor in terms of our ability to do justice, to find the kinds of services and supports in the community that people need to succeed on probation, for example. And in the midst of this pandemic, in the midst of the massive adjustments that we all had to make on the fly, we witnessed a national protest movement unlike anything I've ever experienced or seen. It was a protest movement grounded in righteous rage over the murder of George Floyd and so many other black and brown people. These killings include, of course, George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, Dante Wright, and so many others, many of whose names we'll never know. And these tragedies catalyzed a national demand to hold police accountable, to shift movement, to shift resources away from um, simply relying on police as a first line of response to uh, drug overdoses and mental health crises, and to invest in other 
forms of social safety services to demonstrate, in other words, through systemic change that black lives matter. And with all these events, with all these devastating losses has come an increase in consciousness and an opportunity for long overdue change. As district attorney, I'm proud to say that our office has seized on the opportunities to accelerate long overdue reforms. These kinds of efforts remind me of the very reason why I became a lawyer, to commit to public service and to effectuate systemic change. So I wanna share with you just a few of the ways in which I've been able to promote justice through my role um, here as district attorney in San Francisco. One of the things that we've done is we focused on opportunities to right wrongs that are historic wrongs that affected people like Lorenzo and so many others like him from ending up incarcerated in the first place. In other words, to build safety by preventing children from growing up in foster care or without parents. Um, and so one of my very first acts as district attorney was to uh, create a diversion program for primary caregiver parents. Now, this was a state law that had been passed before I took office, but yet to be implemented anywhere in the state. And I'm proud that San Francisco now has referred well over 100 primary caregivers to diversion. And while most of them are still going through the lengthy and rigorous diversion program, uh, those that have completed have almost all done so successfully. We're keeping our community safer by putting parents at home instead of in cages. I also wanna talk about a broader commitment to ending mass incarceration. You know, at the beginning of the COVID pandemic, there was a lot of frustration that the federal government in Washington refused to listen to the scientists, refused to follow medical advice. Well, I'm, I didn't wanna make that mistake. And so I listened to the head of our jail medical department, to the Department of Public Health, when they said, if we did not quickly reduce the number of people in our jail, we would have a epidemic within the pandemic. We would have a massive outbreak of COVID-19 in our jails and in all of the communities that are connected to the jails, the sheriff's deputies, the public health staff, the janitors, the teachers, the case managers that go in and out of the jail every day and home to their families and communities. And we saw what happened across the country when elected officials and public safety officials failed to listen to and follow the science. We follow the science and we save lives. In San Quentin prison, dozens of people died because they didn't follow the science. In Cook County Jail in Chicago, in Rikers Island in New York, in so many other correctional facilities around the country, people died because of a refusal to follow the science. Here in San Francisco, we cut the number of juveniles, the number of children, in our juvenile detention center by over 75%. Over 75%. It doesn't mean we're not prosecuting or holding people accountable. It means we're doing it in ways that didn't expose them and all of us to the kind of conditions that made Chicago's jail the number one vector for the spread of the disease throughout the entire city. And together we prove something that I think many of us already knew, that we don't need to rely on incarceration as a primary response to social ills, that we don't need to rely on more jails and prisons in order to build safety, that instead we should focus on root causes of crime. When our jail medical director told us to reduce the county jail, I had a team that looked at the jail population every single day. We went through the list, who's in jail? Do they need to be there? Is there some other alternative that can allow us to hold them accountable and protect the public without clogging up our jails? And we found some people who never should have been there in the first place. Our efforts were a reminder of the humanity of every single person who touches the criminal justice system, including those who are incarcerated. I wanna tell you just one story of a young woman we found during this process. A young woman who was in San Francisco County Jail serving a sentence for a misdemeanor. It was her first ever criminal conviction. And like the vast majority of people in our jail, she suffered from a drug addiction at the time of her arrest. Now she was also pregnant and the jail medical staff told us that her pregnancy was high risk. But we worked with the jail medical team, with our partners in the public defender and pretrial diversion and our other reentry allies. And we found a prenatal residential facility that was willing and eager to take this young woman in, to take care of her and the baby until it was born. And so we worked with the court, we had her resentenced and we had her transported to the prenatal facility. 
So I'm proud to tell you that here we are over a year later and the baby was born and is healthy. This young woman is still sober. She's now got her own housing. And this is how we build safety. Not by putting high risk pregnant women on misdemeanor convictions in our jail during a global pandemic, but by finding them a safe place to stay sober and give birth to a healthy baby. That's how we prevented an outbreak in our jail. That's how we protected thousands of people across San Francisco who have a connection to the jail through work or family. I wanna talk uh, for a moment now about a um, different area of our work. And it ties into what we discussed earlier, which was the Black Lives Matter movement and the murder of George Floyd. We enacted a wide range of policy reforms uh, to give voice to and concrete uh, uh, deliverables to the Black Lives Matter movement. One of those uh, actions that we took was sponsoring a resolution that would prevent San Francisco from hiring law enforcement officers with a documented history of serious misconduct. We also initiated an effort in partnership with other elected prosecutors who represent about a third of the residents of California to urge the state bar to issue an ethical guide, guideline or rule that would prohibit district attorneys or district attorney candidates from ever directly accepting political support or donations from police unions. Now, the reason for this is we have to work very closely with police unions. Almost every case we prosecute is brought to us by police. We rely on their testimony, on their investigations. And in those instances where we are also called upon to investigate police union members for excessive force or wrongful killing, the public must know that there's not a conflict of interest. They must know that they're getting an independent and neutral decision maker. And they cannot know that when district attorneys rely on the political and financial support of those same unions who are paying the legal defense bills for their members after a killing or other use of force that's investigated criminally. We also know that to rebuild trust in the criminal justice system, we need to enforce laws equally. That means we need the independence and the courage to file cases against police officers when they commit crimes, just like we do day in, day out against folks who don't wear a uniform to work. It means also quickly and transparently clearing officers who use force lawfully in the line of work. And too often, exonerations or, or, or declinations to file charges have been viewed with skepticism by the public because district attorneys are never willing to do the difficult, courageous thing of prosecuting a member of a local police union. Well, in San Francisco, I'm proud that we have both moved faster than ever to exonerate officers and to publicly decline to file charges against those officers who use force lawfully. And we've also filed historic charges against officers who did not use lawful force, including four separate criminal cases with five separate law enforcement officers, one of which is the first ever in the history of San Francisco homicide charges against a officer who, while on duty, shot and killed an unarmed black man. Prosecutors as a whole across this country have failed systemically to hold police accountable, whether for lying on the witness stand or for physical violence. We have the power to drive change. And so in my office, we have done just that. In addition, and consistent with my promise to the San Francisco voters to focus on victims, not only on punishment. We also created a policy to compensate victims of police violence, just like we compensate any other victim of violence. Too often when people of color are harmed by police violence, they or their families are unable to pay for medical bills, funeral or burial expenses. And my view is that someone who is killed by the state should not have to have their family rely on a GoFundMe page to cover funeral expenses. So we made sure our office will provide equal benefits and services to victims of any violence. And now that policy is has become a model for state legislation so that hopefully the rest of California will follow suit. Now, prosecutors also have to push for the kind of systemic change that motivated me to run for DA in the first place, the kinds of policies that I've talked about tonight. We have to look at society more broadly, 
to identify places where racial disparities exist, where class disparities exist, and if they're exacerbated or amplified by the legal system, it is our obligation to make change. There are so many other examples of the really significant reforms that we've been part of, that we've partnered with others to help implement, to drive social justice and public safety. We refused to prosecute kids as adults. We got the last person off of California's death row out of San Francisco County, effectively ending San Francisco's use of the death penalty. As part of our work to support kids, I also co-sponsored legislation that would provide universal basic income to kids aging out of the foster care system. And I'm so proud of this work because it's not just about waiting for a crime to get committed, hoping the police investigate and arrest and then prosecuting so we can punish. It's about prevention. Prosecution and punishment, we do that every day when people get arrested, but we need to build safer communities and we do that through prevention. We know that young people aging out of foster care are uniquely at risk, both to be victims of crime and to end up incarcerated themselves. And so providing universal basic income through state legislation is a critical and humane and cost-effective way that we can support young people who don't have the second chances or supportive family that I was lucky enough to land in after my own parents' incarceration. We know that we need to do more and that we have a lot of challenges ahead. And I could spend um, uh, many, many more hours discussing uh, policies that we're implementing, the six different state laws that I'm co-sponsoring, um, the ways in which we are trying to focus city resources on supporting those in need rather than criminalizing their poverty. Um, but I also want to just briefly mention something that I really encourage other district attorney's offices around the country to do. And that is as part of our commitment to equal enforcement of the law, it's not just about police. It's also about those, uh, those other groups and categories that have tremendous power, so much so that traditionally and historically, they have been above the law. We launched a worker's rights unit in my office so that we can prosecute systemic wage theft, so that we can prosecute those employers who deprive their employees of safe working conditions. Uh, or um, or uh, what we saw throughout the pandemic is those on the front lines working, weren't getting access to PPE, weren't getting paid minimum wage, weren't getting uh, basic protections to which all employees are entitled. And so we filed a lawsuit, a civil enforcement action against DoorDash and Handy, companies that have policies that blatantly violate the laws governing how they must classify and compensate their employees and also how they must pay taxes into the state uh, workers' compensation fund and unemployment fund, effectively victimizing not only one person, the way that we see in our robbery cases or our assault cases, but tens of thousands of people were victims in these cases. And so we've done that work and more to ensure that we are um, uh, really enforcing laws in ways that are equitable. Now, um, I, I have a lot more that I want to talk about, but I want to be respectful of time and I want to save some of the things that um, we are confronting, some of the obstacles like the rise in gun violence, um, like the um, reopening process and the way in which that's dramatically changing crime trends, impacting tourism and small businesses, um, like some of the resistance that we're seeing from uh, particularly police unions and um, those forces in our society that are deeply committed to the failed status quo. Um, but let me save that for questions and, and simply close by saying that I think all of us here are dedicated to promoting and building a justice system that we proudly can call just to improving our legal system. And so I want to thank you for bringing me here today to share some of my experiences um, and I want to thank you in advance for all the work that you will continue to do in the years ahead. When I uh, embarked on this journey of running for district attorney, I never could have predicted how hard it would be, um, but I also wouldn't have anticipated how much change we could implement this quickly. It really does take all of us to push against a system that is so often uh, devoid of humanity, of compassion, of love. I am as committed 
as I ever have been to honoring the values on which I campaigned and on which the people of the city and county of San Francisco elected me to serve as their district attorney. We will center crime victims and survivors in making decisions that impact their lives. We will disrupt cycles of crime and poverty that harm families and create crime rather than stop it. We will hold anyone, including those that wear uniforms or work in billion dollar corporations accountable if they break the law or violate the trust that we place in them. And I will fight every day to make sure that our system better treats kids and those who are impacted by incarceration. I owe it to Lorenzo. Thank you. I'm happy to take any of your questions. Thank you very, very much. Uh, uh, it was what an incredible speech, sir. And uh, we, on behalf of the youth leadership team and the Judicial Council of California, are grateful for your wisdom. Um, we would like to ask anybody who wants to ask a question, show your hands as your MC. We ask you to raise your hands. And then if you wouldn't mind, Mr. District Attorney, you can choose whose hands you see raised that you might want to respond to, uh, per giving you permission to ask a question. Uh, Dr. Pritchard, I uh, appreciate that. I don't know that I'll be able to see people's hands as I only see um, the four of us or five of us in the panel. I don't see any other. Uh, Maybe see. we could have, uh, there's one hand, they're coming up. Uh, they're, I'm not they're seeing them. Yeah. Um, I'm Let's go with the first hand. That, they have them on, uh, they have them on, uh, Chessa, they have them on uh, the. Uh, on the participant the panel, or I see Derek's right. hand up. Go ahead, Derek. There. Can you hear me, sir? Yeah, I can hear you, Derek. Go ahead. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, as a member of the Board of Directors for the California Association of Youth Courts, I really would like to uh, thank you uh, personally and professionally uh, for the work that you're doing. Uh, your story is very, very compelling. Uh, it gave me, uh, I spent 42 years in the law enforcement arena my last nine years was with the FBI in Sacramento. I, uh, I commend you for your work. And uh, what was interesting was the fact that you brought forth the story of being a young child, having to go visit your parents in prison. That is, uh, I've never, and then, and then currently being district attorney. That's, that's, a, that's a very interesting twist. The question that I have is, how do you see the California Association of Youth Courts moving forward to be more recognized by the judicial system? I believe that we are the tip of the spear right now uh, because of the fact that the juvenile justice system is broken. And I don't see an alternative other than youth courts. Um, do you have any suggestions or directions that we might that might be helpful for us to to pursue uh in in our endeavor of reintroducing youth courts uh to the criminal justice system thank you for your work derek and for the question um i agree with you that juvenile justice is in many ways the tip of the spear and i think that always comes mm -hmm. with challenges and opportunities and you know as we decrease uh, reliant on incarceration for young people as we honor commitments like the one I made to never prosecute a juvenile as an adult, uh, it does mean that we'll also have increasingly serious kinds of crime that are being handled by the, our youth system. And so we need more robust resources. We need more, uh, more creative and diverse uh, approaches. And I think, um, you know, when it comes to the kind of advocacy for uh, youth courts that you mentioned, Derek, I think it's something that has to happen at the local level and at the state level. We need our local board of supervisors, um, you know, our county councils to be aware of the role that um, youth courts can play. And we also need our state legislators to be uh, invested in building out the kinds of humane alternatives that can save lives rather than simply warehousing them. And it's gonna take all of us uh, at every level of society to create the kind of infrastructure that's needed to be successful. And, I, and I'll tell you really concretely why I think it's such a big fight. Look. Um, it took decades, centuries perhaps, to build up the criminal 
legal system that we have today. And it does some things really, really well, but we're all aware of its shortcomings and its flaws. And if we want to build an alternative approach, we need to do it carefully and intentionally and rigorously. And we need to build and test and study the alternatives. We need empirical evidence. That takes work. That's not something that one district attorney or one judge can do on their own. It requires partnerships and community with grant giving bodies, with funding bodies. And as we build those alternatives and show that they work, there are going to be those who point to any failure or any shortcoming or any tragedy and use that, use that tragedy, exploit that tragedy to undermine change. Right. And, and so folks are going to say, Derek, oh, well, youth courts don't work or um, community placement doesn't work or restorative justice doesn't work. They're going to say that and they're going to find some example of someone who went through one of those processes and ended up getting rearrested for a serious crime, for a tragic crime. And they're going to ignore the fact that two thirds of people getting out of our state prison system will be reincarcerated within a couple of years. They'll ignore the fact that there's no other area of government bureaucracy as our prison system that has such a high failure rate. And so we need to be mindful of those kinds of attacks. And we need to highlight and emphasize and tell the stories that are successful because it's too easy to promote fear by cherry picking the failures. So let's lead with love, with optimism, with courage, with unity, and by telling the stories that we're proud of. Thank you. I see uh, Helen has her hand up as well. So um, that was a very moving story about you and Lorenzo. And um, it's hard for me not to wonder why you kind of let him go. Why didn't you, um, or, it, or maybe you did try to do something for that particular young person whom you knew. Thanks for the question, Helen. You know, um, I, it's one of those things in life where hindsight's twenty twenty. And if I had any idea that Lorenzo was getting caught up in a bad crowd or that he was uh, committing crimes, I am absolutely certain I would have tried to intervene. But I want to sort of provide a little context. He was two or three years older than me. And he lived in Brooklyn. I lived in Chicago. And this is before social media or cell phones, right? Um, and so I knew Lorenzo because we built a relationship in the prison visiting room and going to and coming from prison visits. When Lorenzo started to get in trouble, he also stopped visiting his mother in prison. And I didn't have any way to see him or contact him. And it wasn't until he was incarcerated with my father that I knew what had become of him. Um, and I certainly didn't let him go at that point, Helen. I went to visit him. I wrote a research paper my freshman year at Yale, looking at the different paths our lives had taken and trying to make sense of the uh, racial disparities in criminal justice and also make sense of something Lorenzo was very insistent on, that he made choices and he wanted to take responsibility for his choices. Um, and then once he served his time, Helen, and was transferred over to immigration detention for deportation uh, proceedings, I found him a lawyer an immigration lawyer that represented him pro bono and tried to fight against his deportation. And when that failed and he got deported back to Guyana, I went to visit him there. Um, and I'm still in touch with him today. So I, I did not let him go in, in any way, uh, but we did have maybe a 10-year gap when we had no contact. I, I hope that provides a little bit more context. Yes, it does. Thank you. Uh, I see another question from uh, Kemmel. And forgive my pronunciation, I get it all the time as well. I get a lot of, lot of trouble with my name. So I, I hope in solidarity, you'll appreciate uh, any mispronunciation of your name. Oh, no worries. I, I, I appreciate somebody at least getting it remotely closely. I've grown up and I've heard a lot worse. So I appreciate that. <laughs> is it Kamal? How do you say yeah, it? It is Kamal. It's Kamal. Kamal. All right, there we go. Second, hey. second try. Yeah, no worries. No, thanks for uh, allowing me to speak. Um, I'm a, actually a restorative justice uh, practitioner and I um, work for a county government in California. So definitely aligned and appreciating the work that you do. I guess I have a question in the sense of when you spoke about being intentional, you know, when you're talking about youth courts, you know, in my experience, you know, it's just interesting to see when we're building, you know, how we create these networks. Are, 
because it's related to accounting, because it's related to government, um, but we do know we want this to be as uh, holistic, right, from a restorative lens. As we're building, do we want that? How do you build? I guess my question is, how do you build with the intention of the restorative lens and community um, a foundation without making it too rigid or too tied to the ju um, judicial system? And, you know, what are, you know, what are some of those strategies? And I guess that's, I think, where we're just trying to figure out the right mode. Well, thank you for your work, Kamal. And, you know, finding ways to restore and heal people who've been harmed is a number one priority for me and for my office. And if we can do it in ways that also uh, holds accountable those that cause the harm and maybe even requires them to be part of that healing, I think we're all better off, right? Yeah. Um, and that's really the challenge. It's like, how do we do that? What does it look like? And without diving too deep into a theoretical debate that is happening nationally amongst restorative justice advocates, I'm sure you're aware of Kamal, that there are those folks who say the, that restorative justice should not be used as a net widening um, uh, tool or, 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 or practice. And therefore we as prosecutors should never be referring cases to restorative justice if there's not enough evidence for us to ethically file criminal charges. And I can see the logic that I can understand that. We don't want to have a mission creep, so to speak, and we have limited resources. So we really should be focusing on those cases where we believe we could uh, uh, file criminal charges and prove them. There's also those folks in the community that say, well, we should never uh, file charges and then tell someone they can do restorative justice if they choose because that's coercive. And so it puts us in a little bit of a box, right? They say, well, you should only do it pre-charging, um, but only in those cases where you've already decided that you will charge. And, and then of course the problem is um, that limits us to the, the, by definition, the least serious kinds of crime and not necessarily the ones that are best uh, set up for restorative justice. In other words, if we're gonna do restorative justice only pre-charging, that means people are gonna be out of custody. That means we're not going to use it for serious violent crimes. Um, now, I, I like to be able to explore restorative justice whenever victims want us to do that, mm -hmm. including in serious and violent crimes. I had, a, I had a mother whose son was murdered years before I took office, and I met with her, as I do with any victim or family of, of a victim of homicide that wants to meet with me. And the man who we believe killed her son has been in jail for about five years since he was arrested after the murder. And the case is slowly, slowly working its way closer to trial, very, very slowly. And the mother said to me in this meeting, you know, I really, I just wonder, like, I know, she said to me, I know that it could have been him instead of my son that got killed. I know the life that they were both living. I know it could have been him, but it wasn't. It was my son. And I really want to know how he feels about what he did. Now, that, that kind of question is not one that the criminal justice system is well equipped to answer. It's one that restorative justice practices can help to answer. Right. It's one that can help to give that mother some kind of closure in a way that even a life sentence might not do. And so when I, appro when I approach restorative justice, I approach it first and foremost as a victim's rights issue. And I approach it as one that is uh, diverse and adaptable to even the most serious violent crimes, because I don't think of it as an either or approach. I think of it as a tool that we can use to enhance our ability to both support victims who need healing and on the other side, uh, promote accountability. Because, and this is something I learned from my mother, you know, I don't wanna digress, but my mother did 22 years. And we use a lot of restorative practices um, in our family. Um, and that's part of how I recovered from my anger and my hurt and, and my resentment and feeling of abandonment. Um, but, you know, when you're, when you're a criminal defendant, when you're accused of a crime in our system, our adversarial system, your lawyer tells you, invoke your, 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 your Fifth Amendment rights, remain silent, don't talk. They tell you, well, it might have been self-defense. And they argue the jury, the other guy started it, or they argue that, that um, it wasn't your fault because it was an accident, right? That's, that's what they do. And so they, they teach you as a person accused of a crime not to take responsibility. And then if you lose your trial, you get sentenced to prison, then you're appealing, right? And your appeal lawyer says, well, your trial lawyer made some mistakes and, and it was ineffective assistance of counsel. 
And, and you know, if you had a good lawyer, maybe this wouldn't have happened. And so the entire system is set up in a way that tells people not to take ownership or responsibility for the harm that they've caused. And I believe restorative justice can help fill that void. I believe we need ways to encourage and promote and incentivize people to take a hard look in the mirror and recognize the harm that they have caused. Because if they don't do that, they won't change their lives. And I'll tell you that more important, more significant to my mother in her transformation from the person who participated in armed robbery to the woman she is today with a PhD, a founder of the Center for Justice at Columbia University, a loving mother and soon to be grandmother because my wife is due in just a couple months. Um, mm -hmm. Far more important than the 22 years she spent in a cage was when she met one of the victims of her crime on a prison visit. And they got to know each other. And my mother came face to face with the horrific harm that her crime had caused in a way that no number of years in prison ever would have allowed her to see. So thank you for your work, Kamal. I, I know I don't have an easy answer, but I think those are some of the, the themes that I'm grappling with, and I'd be happy to continue the conversation um, you know, uh, in a different forum or when we have more time. Great, thanks so much. Look forward to it. Now, I, I uh, find it hard to believe I've answered everybody's questions, but I don't see any other hands um it's uh maybe we maybe we got some folks who are shy or um maybe we're just out of time i don't know how much more time we have here but i'm happy to take one more if we have time for it all right sandra last word Hi, thank you so much for doing this. Um, I think I heard a piece on public radio uh, when you were running for uh, election. I thought it was really, really interesting, um, you know, your background and uh, how you look at justice. And um, I just wanted to ask, you know, what has been the transition been like for you going from a public defender to district attorney and how have your staff, you know, the other DAs been, you know, what has their reaction been to your approach and your um, your look at uh, justice and transforming uh, the justice system? Well, thank you, um, Sandra. I'm, I'm glad to hear that uh, despite listening to that public radio piece, you still wanted to come back and, and hear some more, get an update on, on how we've been doing since then. I appreciate that for sure. Um, and you know, you're, you're absolutely right, it's a, it's a big transition. And let me just say, personally, I have loved the transition. Uh, and I say that as someone who um, absolutely you know, relished every part of my job as a public defender. Um, and, and so let me explain how it can be that I love being a public defender and I also have loved the transition to being a prosecutor. As a public defender, your ethical obligation, your duty is to one person, it's to your client. Now, of course, you have to follow the law. You have to, to, to uh, have candor with the court. I, I see we've got a judge here with us. I'm, we always have to have candor with the court. That's very important. But your core purpose is to zealously advocate for that one person, that one person who has that unique relationship with you as your client. And as district attorney, it's a much more complicated, and I don't say this in any way to minimize the challenges of being a public defender, but it is a much more complicated ethical duty because I don't represent one person, not the victim, not the person accused of a crime. I represent everybody. I represent the people who aren't even involved in the case. I represent all of us. And I have to give voice to the values of San Francisco as we enforce the laws of the state of California. It's a delicate balancing act in every single case. And that challenge is one, that learning curve is one that I've really relished. It gives us an opportunity to think about more than just retribution, which of course many victims desire, uh, or than just about freedom or evading accountability, which many public defenders seek for their clients. It forces us to grapple with the imperfect tools that we have as a society and to find ways to do what we were talking about a moment ago, to heal those who've been harmed, and to hold those who cause the harm accountable in ways that set them up to succeed when they rejoin our community. It is a very difficult job, but I love it. And I wake up every morning just honestly feeling so lucky to be in this position, to have the trust of the people of this great city, to have the opportunity in this unique moment in American history to try and do things a little bit better 
than they've been done before. Um, and it's, uh, I, you know, it's, it's not an easy job. Mm -hmm. And it's one that I think um, probably, you know, we'd be better off if more people had the opportunity to experience because there are impossible decisions. And hindsight is 2020. And every day we are balancing risk of all different kinds against constitutional rights and mandates. We are dealing with a large population of folks who we know are both victims of crime and perpetrators of crime, of folks who are living in and out of cycles of poverty and addiction and abuse. And we're doing our best with very imperfect tools and far, few, far too few resources to build safer, stronger communities. Um, and that's a, it's a phenomenal thing to be a part of and to have the chance to try my hand at. So I'm just appreciative that I, the people of San Francisco gave me this opportunity. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Sandra, and thank you all. I wanna uh, be respectful of time. I think we're, we're at time, if I'm not mistaken. We are, and thank you very, very much, Mr. District Attorney. Uh, hoping that you go on to teach uh, for years and years to come in the law school system of our nation. And uh, all of us uh, at the youth leadership team and the judicial council are grateful for your time. And I'd like to introduce uh, Judge Cousins, who will tell all of us a little bit about our uh, judicial council and the youth leadership team. Your Honor. Good morning. Uh, I'm Richard Cousins, as indicated. I'm a member of the uh, Board of Directors of the California Youth Court Association and its founding president. Uh, on behalf of Judge Charles Irvin, uh, who's the current president of CAYC, and all of the board members, I'd like to welcome you all to our 15th annual Youth Court Summit. CAYC was formed for the purpose of supporting the, the creation and expansion of youth courts in California. Our mission, as indicated by the prior speaker, is to break that prison to school pipeline, a school to prison pipeline, I should say, uh, by supporting peer driven restorative justice as an alternative to the formal juvenile justice system. It is truly justice by youth for youth. More details about our work at the association uh, and of youth courts uh, in uh, California may be found at our website uh, at calyouthcourts.com. I, I urge you to visit, it has lots of information. Now, while CAYC offers a variety of support services, our primary activity each year is our annual youth summit. We hope you'll take advantage of the opportunity to see the different kinds of youth courts and services that can be offered. Uh, and, and you'll quickly learn as I did that there is no one way of doing things. There's no one right answer. They all work well and much depends on what you want to create for your own community. CAYC really depends on the support of the people it serves. We particularly wish to thank the tremendous support of the California Judicial Council uh, and its uh, uh, Center for Families, Children, and the Courts. Their financial support and their in-kind services are just beyond measure. Finally, I do want to acknowledge the fabulous work done this year by our youth leadership team. This is the first time this conference has been led entirely by the youth. They have done a wonderful job in creating an informative and entertaining youth court uh, summit for you. We sincerely hope that you have fun and pick up many great ideas that you can take back to your own courts and stay safe and enjoy the summit. Thank you, Michael. Your Honor, thank you so much for a life of giving and sacrifice to all of us in the state of California. We are in your debt for your wisdom, your emotional intelligence, and your great compassion. All of us in the state of California owe you for your leadership a great debt of gratitude. All of us appreciate uh, your honor and our. you can go to our website and look at our, our board. We've run out of time, but thank you all. Please attend the uh, rest of the uh, summit's workshops and make sure you uh, write a letter to all of the folks from all of the uh, judicial boards and to all of those who are speaking to let them know the impact they've had on your hearts and your brains and wisdom. Thank you. Please go see our other workshops and thank you very, very much. We're grateful to all of you for attending.